do to them what the wolf does to them, as long as they're in my hand. And you know what? And then he goes one verse further, and he says, my father's greater than all of them. Daddy's greater than me. Daddy's greater than you. And my daddy's not going to let anybody snatch him out of his hand either. So there's no wolf that can catch this good shepherd off guard. Now let me tell you how I hatchet job this verse for a long time. What I must have missed somewhere along the way was the context. I must have missed that Jesus has already told us that the wolf is out there to snatch us up. And that wolf is a thief. And that thief just wants to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. But Christ came so that I could have life and that I could have it more abundant. But he also came in verse 28 so that I could have eternal life, which is life without end. Now that speaks to my theological side that wants to know how long this thing lasts. How long are you really saved for? And how I hatcheted up the following verses is because somewhere along the way I had missed the fact that Jesus has said, I give my sheep eternal life and nobody can ever come along and steal from them, kill from them, kill them or destroy them. Why? Because it's the same chapter. It's the same story. And Jesus hasn't changed topics. He hasn't even changed audiences. But thank God by the time he gets to 28, he's included us. And he said, for those whom I have given eternal life. Let me ask you this question, both here and around the world. How many of you have received eternal life by your faith in Jesus? Now, that's an easy amen. You say, well, I'm not really sure if I have eternal life, Pastor. I can't see it. Well, then you have to receive eternal life by faith because the kingdom doesn't come by your observation. The kingdom doesn't come because of what you see, touch, taste, feel here. The kingdom comes because you believe on a man named Jesus who died in your place, who took the punishment of sins into himself, and now you've been made just and righteous based on no works of your own but on the finished work of Christ. You either believe that or you don't. Now, if you don't believe that, we don't have much common ground, quite frankly. I don't argue anymore with people who don't believe in righteousness by faith. I did for a long time. I fought and fought and fought and argued and argued and argued, and in some ways it might have sharpened some of the beliefs that I came to understand with grace. And then one day I said, that's enough. I'm not going to fight any longer with people who... who we do not have a basis for argument. If you don't have faith in the finished work of Christ, you have faith in your unfinished work. Well, I don't have any faith in your unfinished work. You and I have nothing to talk about. You're going to sit and argue with me all day long about what you think I should be finishing. I think my Jesus has finished it all. So we're just going to run our heads into a brick wall. So the reality is, is if that's you, I don't think there's a soul here that's that way. And there's probably not even many logged in around the world that's that way, or they wouldn't have stuck around this long. But in the event that there's anybody there that's that way, we have no common ground. But for those who do have faith, you know that you have received eternal life. Well, then the good news is, if you have received eternal life, you have this promise, verse 28, you're never going to perish. That sounds good, right? I didn't say you're not going to die in the flesh. I said you're never going to perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not what? Perish, but have everlasting life. You don't have to worry about getting ate up by the wolf. Why? Because I have faith. My faith is in Christ. And here's the second piece of good news. Nobody is going to pluck you, snatch you, take you away by force out of the hand of Jesus. Now, I hatchet job that to death because I believe that people backslid all the time. I thought that you were saved one day and lost the next. If you weren't lost that day, you'd be lost the next one. I wasn't quite sure how many days it took to be lost, but I was positive that you could get on that road and in just a few days you could find yourself lost. In fact, if you'll listen, there are people to this day and one of the saddest things I ever hear is to watch some gray-haired little old lady on her deathbed say, boy, I just hope I've done enough to get home. I've lived for Jesus. I heard I had a pastor friend tell me this week, said I got a 90-year-old in my church, told my wife this week, this guy's preaching grace like crazy in his church. Said I got a 90-year-old granny in my church, told my wife this week on her way to the hospital, said, I just hope that I don't fail in these final moments and end up without Jesus. And my pastor friend said, Paul, I don't know what else to do. I'm preaching grace radically. I'm telling them about the finished work. I don't know what else to say to somebody. I said, I, I hope that in these last weeks, months of my life, I don't do something stupid and miss out on heaven as my home. The reality is, is somewhere in her life, somebody told her that her eternal life was less than eternal, that perishing was in her future, and that somebody, maybe even herself, could indeed pluck her out of Jesus' hand. But I got good news for you tonight. 
And you can take this or you can leave it. You can believe this or you can reject it. Frankly, I've went far enough down the road of God's grace. I'm not concerned anymore to stick around too long with those who just flat out don't want to believe it and want to fight about it. But the reality that I feel in my heart is, is the scriptures are true and what Jesus said is true. I'm not saying this ministry, that ministry, this church, that church, but I know a man named Jesus who made this statement. I give those who follow me eternal life and they shall never perish and nobody will ever snatch them up out of my hand against their will. So I'm believing that if my Jesus said it, my Jesus can do it. That's what I believe. And that's what I believe the word says. No wolf. I ain't scared of the wolf. I'm not scared of the devil. I'm not scared of the enemy. People say, boy, you don't give much credit to the demonic spirits of this world. I say, no, you're wrong. I don't not only give much, I give none. Why don't you? Don't you think they're powerful? No, you ain't met my Jesus. I mean, I'm not trying to be smart, Alec. I mean, you literally haven't met my... All power in heaven and earth has been given to my Jesus. That means there's nothing left for the enemy, for the devil, for the forces of darkness. Anything that's out there, you're just making it up. I'm not saying they're not out there, but they're powerless. They're toothless, man. I got someone who no wolf, no wolf can pluck me out of the hand of Jesus. And Jesus said, if that ain't good enough for you, my dad's greater than all of you. That's the 29th verse. He said, and nobody can pluck you out of daddy's hand. And just so they wouldn't get confused, he throws in verse 30, I and my father are the same person. And that was the stuff right there that got him in trouble. He could have stopped and he'd have been all right, but he went one verse too far and he said, me and daddy are the same guy. And so they take up stones to stone him in 31. And Jesus said, I've done a whole bunch of good works that I showed you for my father. Which one of these works are the ones you're stoning me for? Man, I love that question. Let me just try to break it down in, in the way I would, might say it. Say, You know, I've tried to show you guys how good God is. Which one of the good works that I've been preaching to you is the one you want to fire me over? Which one of the good works is the one you want to cut my head off over? Which one of the... Was it the message about you being the righteousness of God in Christ that you didn't like, or was it the message about God has died at Calvary so that you could uh, have health and wholeness? Was it that your sins are completely gone in the blood of Jesus, or was it the one where I told you that as he is, so are you in this world? Let me, just let me ask you, which one of the good works was it? This is what Jesus says. Because was it walking on the water? Was it feeding the 5,000? Was it raising the dead? Was it, was it healing the palsied man? Or how about the time I touched the leper or spit on the ground? so that Because that had already happened. This is John 10. How about the time when I spit on the ground and told the guy to go wash at the pool of Siloam? Or that, that day that I was in the temple and I told the woman caught in the act of adultery, go sin no more. Which one of these life-altering, life-changing events do you want to kill me for? Man, I think that question needs to come back from the grace message towards religion. And if I, I may be the one that has to ask it. I may have to point people out in this church and go, which one of these former adulterers, drug addicts, alcoholics, pornographers, which one of these that has had their life completely and irreversibly changed by the finished work, which one of these do you want to look in the eye and tell them they didn't really get saved because they didn't hear it your way? Let me march them all up here. I mean, let me bring to you successful marriages put back together and kids coming home and, and bodies being healed. And, and let, let me show you people who spent their lives trying to work for a God they thought was perpetually mad at them but are now convinced that he loves them. And yet they keep showing up to church, strangely enough, and putting money in the offering. Let me, let me march all of them in front of you. And I want you to point out the one that got it the wrong way. Hey, why not ask those questions? That's what Jesus said. He goes, well, you guys just tell me. I want to put all my stuff out in front of you because you've obviously been inventorying my whole ministry. So I'm going to throw it all out there in front of you. I want you to tell me which one you didn't like. And they go, oh, well, and I love how they back off. 33, they go, oh, well, it's, for, it's not for a good work that we've shown you. It's for blasphemy because you being a man Make yourself out to be God. And here comes the controversial statement that is the source of my title tonight. The part of the text that at one point when I taught it, I was... <laughs> and then moved on. Jesus says, Isn't it written in your law that I said, You are God's? Now notice that I played it safe by putting the question mark on the screen. The question mark is not... Jesus does not put the question mark in there because he's not sure. 
The question mark is because the whole statement is a question. But I believe that the phrase, he's not in doubt whether it's in the Bible or not. He says, isn't it written, you are God's? Little g. If he called them God's, to whom the word came, and the scripture cannot broken, be broken, called them gods to whom the word came. The word did not come to God. The word came to man. And Jesus, by his own mouth, says God called the ones that received it gods. So how can you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you're a blasphemer because I said I'm the Son of God. Do you realize what Jesus is saying? What he's telling the Pharisees here is, if your Bible already says that you are gods, why are you getting so ticked off if I say I'm the Son of God? What Jesus is trying to do is establish an identity in his audience that, that religion caused them to lose. You see, religion and law lets you have no identity because religion and law demands that you be a slave. This is why people get up and make statements like this in church. Well, this, I'm, let, me play, let me play my fake testimony service, all right? Guy gets up in service, grabs the microphone. Yeah, I just want to testify tonight for the Lord. You know... I'm sorry, I really did. I just wanted to just give you a straight testimony. No silliness. Let me start again. Scene. Yeah, I just want to say tonight I love the Lord. I just want to make heaven my home. I'm just trying to be a servant for Jesus. You know, he died for me. At least I can do is be a servant for him. Just want to be a slave for God. Pray for me. That was the microphone getting past to the next guy. Did you hear that statement? And, and I know I, I just threw it in there in, in a silly little testimony, but that's so common in the church. I just want to be a servant for God. Help me. Uh, church, would you just pray that I can serve God better? Anybody ever hear that? Church, I want you all to pray for me this week that I can serve God better. Did you know that God brought you into the family of God as a son because he was sick and tired of having a bunch of slaves? He had slaves in Egypt. He had slaves in the wilderness. He had slaves on the other side of the Jordan. And so he sent his own son and said, I'm tired of slavery. Because if you have slaves, eventually they hate you. He said, I never want them to hate me. I want them to love me. I want to be good to them like a father is to his kids. So, son, I want you to go down there and I want you to change their, my image. And I want you to show them that I'm compassionate and that I'm loving. And if any of them open their mouth and ask you to show how bad I am, I want you to rebuke them and tell them they don't know what spirit they're of because I'm not doing stuff that way. And I'm not going to open the earth up and I'm not going to kill them and I'm not going to shoot lightning bolts at them. And I want you to go down there and I want you to touch their sick. And I want you to raise their dead and I want you to heal them. And I want you to show them that I love them and that I care for them. And man, did Jesus ever do a good job. So that we might receive adoption of sons. So that we could identify with the Son and then be received by the Father. I'm not, I don't mean to hurt any feelings, but God's not interested in you being a servant. God's interested in you being a son. Well, Pastor, don't you think we ought to serve the Lord? I think if you're a son, you will serve the Lord. But I think we're going about it backwards thinking that we can serve Him and someday we'll be sons. Be a son now and just serve. Be a son that serves. Praise God. Now, let's go see the source scripture because in verse 34 he said is it not written in your law psalm chapter 82 i find it fascinating that the text jesus quotes is from the book of psalms yet he called it the law isn't that interesting i thought it should have been somewhere in the pentateuch it should have been exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy somewhere where we would categorize the law but i find it fascinating that when paul quoted isaiah in first corinthians 12 when he talked about this is the rest this is the refreshing tongues. He said, in the law it is written, and he quoted Isaiah. When Jesus says, in your law, he quotes Psalms. So this teaches me something. God viewed the entire Old Testament as the capsule of the law. Everything inside of it, God said, is the law. And so what we're seeing when we jump back here into Psalms is in the midst of the law. Okay, Psalm chapter 82 is not a real long chapter, so we're going to read the whole thing. And I think that in it, you're going to see some fascinating stuff, starting in verse 1. God stands 
in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly? Now, we're, not, we're, we're certainly not going to just read that and not comment. I'm just going to read to our point first, okay? How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not. Neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. I stop right there for now. We'll finish the chapter in a little bit, but there's your verse. There it is. Remember John 10? Jesus said, is it not written in your law? You are gods. Did you know where he's quoting? Psalm chapter 82, verse 6. I have said you are gods. This is not man talking to God because it's little g. It's God talking to man. It says you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. So see, it doesn't make any sense for the little g to have just been mistranslated. And it should have been big g because that's somebody's argument. Go, well, it didn't mistranslate. It should have said God. It's talking about God. But no, because the rest of the verse says all of you are the children of the Most High. So it wouldn't have made any sense for him to say you are God. All of you are the children of the Most High. In fact, I ran the Hebrew. Because I just really wanted to see what God's meant in the Hebrew. I ran it for verse 1. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. The word God standeth in the congregation. Elohim standeth in the congregation of the Almighty. That's the name for God, right? He judges among the gods. Hebrew for gods. Elohim. Let's skip to verse 6. I have said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. The word gods, Hebrew, Elohim. So you go, perhaps it's possessive. Perhaps it's you belong to God. You all are gods. But something doesn't flow quite right because the text is speaking to a group of people who have lost their identity and forgotten their mission. Because look at what their mission was in verse 3. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They don't know. Neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. This is not the writer saying, God, it's your job to deliver the poor and needy. No, it's God saying to the little gods, you have a job. You're supposed to be delivering the poor and needy. You're supposed to be helping them. You're supposed to be helping people that are walking in darkness and showing them light. Do you realize that when Jesus came, he did all of these things? And he didn't do them just so you would have an example of what a good guy's like. I told you this Sunday morning, he did everything that he did to try to put into living color what the kingdom was going to look like. I was trying to show you that when the kingdom comes, you're going to help that guy that's on the side of the road. When the kingdom comes, you're going to put mud on the eyes of the blind man. When the kingdom comes, you're going to feed the 5,000. When the kingdom, he tried to get them to do it when he was here. Are they hungry? They go, yes, Lord, they're hungry. They've been sitting here all day. He goes, feed them. You ever, you ever read that? In the, in the, feed them. And they go, oh, Lord, we don't have enough money to feed them. And Jesus just ignores it, takes it and says, thank you, Father. You know what he's doing? He's, I'm going to show you how to live in the kingdom. See, because on this earth, you're just going to talk about what you don't have. But in the kingdom, I'm going to teach you to thank God for what you do. That's kingdom life, man. That's a principle. That's going, I'm not going to sit all day and dwell on what I don't have, but instead, I'm going to say, thank you, Father. That's what Jesus was doing. Thank you, Father, for what I do have. Now just do what you want with it, Daddy. Because Jesus never said, thank you, Father. Now, fellas, we're going to get 12 baskets back. Watch this. No. Jesus said, thank you, Father. And he said, pass this out. He didn't tell them what was going to happen. He didn't tell them what to expect. He just let the kingdom take over. Church, man, you realize if we can catch this, I think we've caught the, we're kind of catching the tail of a comet right now, what's been happening in this church and this ministry. What we've been catching hold of is we've just been grabbing hold of a little bit of kingdom principle where we started thanking God for letting, for his kingdom spreading. And what he did was he went, well, that's no problem for me. You want to thank me for kingdom? I can, I can put you in buildings. You want to thank me for kingdom? I can, I can promote stuff. I can, I can push the message. I can do it all. He said, I've never had any problem doing it all. The problem is, is the churches always sit around and talk about what they don't have. Are you with me? 
While the church sits around the big thermometer raising the money to go do the things that they want to do, God says, if anybody ever just tap into the kingdom, thank God for the two little fishes and five loaves of bread, I might give you the building. I got to get off that stuff. That just, and that's the kind of stuff just straight gets you in trouble. People just don't like talking to you anymore. <laughs> ah, I want to show you this again. Verse 1 and verse 6. This is the power of this message. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods, little g. Yet the Hebrew says Elohim. And I believe it's very plain that God is not saying he judges amongst himself. But I think the scripture is very plain to say God takes those whom he has created in his likeness and in his image. And he commits to them the work of the kingdom. It's their job to judge righteously. Now, how do you judge righteously? Do you go out here and find people that aren't doing it the way your church does it and smack them upside the head and tell them they ought to change churches? Let me tell you something. If you're doing that in the name of Jesus, stop it. You haven't been listening to Pastor Paul at all. You're misrepresenting our gospel message. Do not go up to anybody in this town and say you ought to switch churches. You ought to leave where you're going and come down to Midland. I will never endorse that. I will not say, hey, great job, good job, go get them. If I've misconstrued the message of grace to make you think that, I'm doing a poor job, okay? It is not our responsibility to go out here and try to clean out other churches. Folks, I don't want other churches cleaned out. I want all the other churches full. And if I've sent any other signal, I'm misrepresenting the message of grace. I don't want them all emptied. I want them all so full that people are standing outside begging to get in to hear about a good God. That would excite the fire. You know what? We still don't have enough seating space. If every church in Popper Bluff was full and everybody in town decided to go next week, there's still not enough churches to go to. So what are we all fighting over two or three people and this family moving to this church and this family transferring to this church? There, we're, there's not enough space if we get out there and reap some harvest. So don't worry about it. Don't go up to somebody who's already found hope. Happy? Excited? And say, oh, yeah, but you'd really be excited if you came down to our church. <laughs> no! Leave them there! Because why? Because what, what, one of the most successful things that's happened in this house is the people that came in came out of a hunger. Not out of an arm twist, not out of a fight, not out of a split, not out of a problem. They came out of a hunger. He said, I'm just going to go down there and find something. I've had, I can't tell you the testimonies of people who said, this is our last stop, man. We've tried everything else. There's no work. We're done. I think, in my heart, I think this is the kind of person I want. I mean, they're just shot on religion. Because, man, if you can give me an hour in a setting like Midland when people shot on religion, oh, man, heaven's going to come down and glory's going to fill you. So I know it is because you've got nothing left but room for God's grace. I mean, it's, just, it's a beautiful opportunity. Kingdom spreading is our job. Proselyting is not our job. Sheep stealing is not our job. Shearing everybody else in our neighborhood is not our job with our little spirit clippers. What do you, what do you guys think about this? What do, you, do, what do you guys think? What do you guys, what's your church think about drinking? What does your church think about abortion? What does your church think about gay marriage? What does your church think about law and grace? What does your church think about the kingdom? And then and all you're doing is just waiting to pounce with your big spirit clippers. You got 15 verses in your back pocket, and Holy Ghost electricity. <laughs> you really got to get back in the text, man. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. Please forgive me. Um, <laughs> I would, but I'm not really. That's my problem. I'm just kind of shearing sheep how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked say listen so the, the reprimand to the little gods and i'm saying that in a spelling way little g i'm gonna explain that okay don't lo don't let me lose you yet the reason this chapter exists is for god to look at the people that were supposed to look like him talk like him walk like him act like him and they weren't. They were judging unjustly. They were, forbid they were neglecting the poor and needy. They were letting the world wander around in darkness while they sat around patting themselves on the back. Aren't we the little gods? Aren't we doing a good job? And God said, I have said you are gods. You're all children of the Most High. Verse 7, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. 
Verse 7 lets anybody who doubts it understand that God is not saying that you are immortal. God is not calling you a God like him. God is saying that you have his characteristics and qualities in you, but you're still going to die like a man, like the princes of the earth, like the very best the earth has to offer. He says, you shall still die. So I'm ultimately going to leave it up to God. Arise, O God, you judge the earth because your representatives are doing a poor job of it. And so Christ came and God judged the earth. Do you believe that? It's exactly, hey, I know, I know it doesn't work right with some of our beliefs about what's coming. But Jesus said, now is judgment come into the earth. Now is the prince of the earth cast out. Not someday, but now. That was back then, which means the prince of the earth has already been dealt with. Sin has already been dealt with. Man, that, that excites me. That means I'm supposed to be doing something in the likeness and in the image of God. I'm part of a special family. Those who know who their daddy is. Now, you are still a man. That's obvious. You are still a woman. You are still going to die. Am I saying that you are God? No, I'm saying what the text says. You are God's in the effect as it relates to your duty in this kingdom. You are representatives of he who is your father. Why is that so shocking? Because the reality is, is that God came and he made man out of dirt and he said, take dominion over the earth. And I'm going to make you in my likeness and in my image. So when you speak, it's me speaking. You have my authority. You carry my weight. And people go, well, that's true, but then Adam lost that. And, but what happened when Jesus came? How many Adams have there been? This is, this is just following up from Sunday morning. See, I just run out of time a lot of times, and I just need a little more room. But how many Adams were there on the other? According to what we preached Sunday morning in the book of Hebrews, said there was a first Adam, and then there was... A last, not a second, not a third, not a fourth, not a fifth. You're not number 9,714 or whatever. You don't have a little number inside of you like that suit coat you got inspected by number 12. And then someday when you get home, God will go, number 9,714,000. Oh, welcome home. I've been keeping count of you since the day you were born. No, he said there was one Adam and there was a last. Adam, who was the last Adam? We read this 1 Corinthians 15. First Adam was Adam, last Adam was Christ. Well, the good news is if there was the last Adam, then he... Must have dealt with Adams. Adams already been dealt with. Thank God my first Adam has been crucified in Christ so that the last Adam could live. My job then is to live, to walk in resurrected life, to walk in power, to go back to a place where I was in his likeness and in his image. Everybody readily admits that man had that in the garden. And then Jesus came and said, today you shall be with me in another garden, a paradise, Eden. I'm going to take that sword off the way to the tree of life, and I'm going to let you back in. I'm going to let you come right back into sweet fellowship with Daddy. The Daddy that you lost fellowship with. You've been sending mediators up a mountain, guys named Moses and Aaron and Joshua, to talk to my Daddy. But I'm going to break all that stuff down. And I'm going to let you boldly go to the throne of grace, and I'm going to let you talk to Daddy yourself. I'm going to tear down the veil. I'm even going to tear down the petition between Jew and Gentile so that nobody feels like they've got a right over anybody else. I'm going to let you go talk to Daddy on your own, and when you get there, you can say whatever you want to him. Because you are accepted in me. Wow. You are accepted in the beloved. Let me prove it to you. New covenant. John chapter 1. Now, let me just slow down here for a second. Tell you something very important, very special. I want to challenge you to read the book of John. If you've never read it, Read it. If you've read it, but you've never read it through the following lens, try it again, and that's this. John was simply giving you a new covenant version of the book of Genesis. Genesis says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So John opened his book and said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And just as God created and fashioned this, 
Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Boom. God created a man. Boom. Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 2, and 3. God created a man. John 1. God created a man. You see it? The creation story. God creates. God is. God creates a man. God kicks that man out of the garden. Jesus comes. God is. God creates a man. Man walks the world right back into that garden. That's, his, that's that whole book. This is why, if you'll read it through that idea, when you get to John 20 and the stone rolls away and Jesus comes out of the tomb, you're in a created world. You're in a whole new world. God has reformed that old and brought out a new. That's why when Jesus walks out of the tomb, he says, go tell my brethren, I've just, I've just brought a new family onto the earth. I've just replenished the earth. It's an incredible piece of literature. So when John says this in John chapter 1, verse 11, he came to his own, and his own received him not. Next up is one of the most incredible verses that many Christians are not grabbing a hold of because we've misunderstood one word in it in the Greek, and I want to help you tonight. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. There are two primary definitions in the Greek of the word power in the New Testament. One is the word dunamos, where we get the English word dynamite. That's the word that's used in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost comes and they all spake with other tongues and they received power. Remember when Jesus said, and you shall receive power, Acts 1.8. Power after that the Holy Ghost comes point. He said dunamos. You shall receive dynamic dynamite power from the Holy Ghost. But that's not the word used here. In John chapter 1, verse 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power is the Greek word exousia. And the word exousia, listen to this, means power of choice, power of authority, and right. So the Bible is telling you, as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God. Now listen to become in the Greek. Genomai, G-I-N-O-M-A-I. Genomai means to come into existence, to begin to be. Are you ready for this one? To receive being. So John said, as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right and privilege to receive sonship. Why are more believers not living in sonship? Because they never exercise their exousia, their spiritual authority. What's their spiritual authority? The right to become sons of God. I've sat in conventions and revivals and heard people preach about the authority of the believer and they were taking authority over stuff and cars and houses and jobs and money and sicknesses and cancers. And not one person in that room had ever exercised their authority to call themselves the sons of God. And they were wondering why in the world they weren't seeing anything happen. Because they were trying to come to God like a bunch of slaves instead of walking into daddy's house like a son. And the first thing you're told you're going to get when you believe on Jesus, you're going to get the exousia, the rights, the access, and the privilege to grab hold of being a son of God. Are you gods? In light of that, absolutely. Absolutely. How? Are you saying I'm a little God? No, I'm saying that the creator of the universe lives inside of you. I'm saying that if you want to exercise it, you have the right. According to John chapter, are we in the book? According to John chapter 1 verse 12, you have the right to exercise sonship. You don't want to call yourself a son? Don't call yourself a son. Pastor, will I still go to heaven? Yes, and you know what? If that's all you still care about, man, I'm doing a poor job preaching. Because I've really been trying to graduate you past missing hell, making heaven. I lived for years just trying to miss hell and make heaven. So glad to be here tonight. I just, just want to say that I just want everybody to pray for me because I just want to make heaven my home. That's it? I, really? You know what? You just lied. You just want to make heaven your home? I don't think so. You want a sandwich when you get home, too. I mean, we tried to be so holy for so long. It's the only thing I really want is just make heaven my home. I don't even need anything from you, God, as long as I can make heaven my home. No! I'm, I'm a son! Daddy, if you got it, I want it. 
Tell you what, Dad, I'm going to take whatever you got. You got a fatted calf? Take a fatted calf. You got shoes for my feet? Take shoes for my feet. You got a ring for my finger? Take a ring for my finger. You got a robe? Take a robe. See, God already gave you the rights to this stuff when Jesus told that story of the prodigal son. Quit dwelling on the kids slopping hogs and dwell on the kid getting home. Man, I've heard, you'll, do a, you'll hear a whole revival on people out here slopping hogs, wasting their substance on riotous living. They're out here tonight in nightclubs. They're running away from God. And then they'll spend five minutes when they play just as I am saying, but you can come home and he'll put a ring on your finger, shoes on your feet. Man, I wish you'd have opened with that. Open with that. Start right there. How many of you realize tonight that you are sons of the living God if you'll exercise your authority? You can have the ring of God's credit. You can have the shoes of God's sonship. You can have the robe of God's righteousness. And daddy will kill the fatted calf on your behalf. And you don't ever have to, you don't ever have to run away again. I wish I'd heard that. That boy finally realized he had the right to exercise sonship. All he had to do was slip the robe on. Praise God. You are, you, you have that right. Now, 1 John chapter 3, I want to take you close to the end of the book. Are you still with me? I got about 10 minutes. I started early, but that doesn't mean I'm going to end early. Don't get too excited. I'm just getting, re- I'm just getting fired up, but I'm, 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 I'm trying to bring it in for a landing. <laughs> 1 John chapter 3. I wrote wow in my Bible a long time ago right next to this verse with a big exclamation point and an arrow. And every time I read it, I realize why I wrote wow. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Don't worry. If they don't understand what you mean when you say I'm a son, that's okay. But oh, how much daddy must love me. John said, oh, what manner of love. The Father has bestowed upon us that he would call us the sons of God. Are you kidding me? This is how I hear John writing this in my head. I hear him go, you got to be kidding me. What what kind of love? Because I know what I used to be. And I know what some of the junk that I've done. What manner of love he must have on me to still call me his son. See, I notice I didn't put that 20 years in my past. I just said, I, you know, I've done some stupid things. But I'm his son. And that's what John says. Beloved, verse 2, now are we the sons of God. When are you the sons of God? Right, right now. Now, this is a verse we put on the screen for early service Sunday. Late service, I had preached so long, I had to drop it. But early service got this verse. And I want to show you something that I walked into my office afterwards. I said, God, you give me another chance Wednesday night. I'm going to clean that. We're going to put one more verse on the back end of that. Because I want to give one more shot. I don't want want you to just walk away and see this. Verse 3, beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And as I preach Sunday morning, the appearances of Christ right here are not necessarily him coming in the clouds. Although I don't discount that. The appearance of Christ here is when you allow Christ to make an appearance in your life, you will begin to see your actions line up with his actions. And I walked into my office and the Holy Spirit began to prompt my heart and said, some still are going to walk away and not quite see that verse that way. And I think John felt the same way when he wrote it. So he keeps writing. And when he gets to chapter 4, go with me, I think it hits him. You know, some people probably read what I wrote a minute ago and said when he appears that we're going to be like him and they're going to think that I'm talking about 10,000 years in their future. So I'm going to clean this up right now. And he writes this in verse 17 of chapter 4. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we where? In, In this world, so are we in this world so john said don't get confused i'm not talking about 10 million years in the future you're going to look like him i'm talking as he is so are you now now don't get depressed if you're not happy with what you see in the mirror and you go this is as good as it gets man i thought we were going to get i thought i was going to get in better shape than this grow some more hair lose some weight because we all got our ideal guy that's over in glory when we get home we know that's what we're going to look like that we get to exchange bodies. <laughs> That's not in the Bible, by the way. 
just in case you were wondering. Don't worry about what will happen over there. Over there is going to be phenomenal. The, word, the Lord has gave me a word for this coming Sunday that deals a little bit with going over there. I don't deal with going over there a whole lot, but um, I'm going to deal with it a little bit. And i got some things stirring on my heart about life, about living that you don't want to miss for Sunday. But as he is, so are we where? In this world. Now go back to John 10. We'll bring it home. This is where we started. John chapter 10. Have you had a good time tonight? I've had a blast. I, I don't think there's anything more fun in the world than bringing the truths out of the Word and just seeing Jesus. See what we've done tonight, see Jesus. Try to make Jesus look good. You can walk out and say, man, didn't Jesus look good tonight? Jesus did a great work for us. John chapter 10, Jesus says this in 37. We'll read on past where we were. If I do not the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. So I say, here's what I think Jesus is saying. You, you guys may not believe that me and Daddy are the same person. That's what Jesus says. You may not believe it. If you don't believe it, I'm not mad at you, he says. But at least pay attention to the things I do because the things I do might convince you that I'm more than meets the eye. Now, as I read that today, I felt the Holy Spirit say, son, that's how you close that tonight. You say to them, you, you don't have to believe that as he is, so am I in this world. You don't have to believe that. Because you're looking up here and you, say, you see Paul White and you say, this guy's off his rocker. There's no, he says, as he is, so am I in this world, but I know better. And so I'll say to you what Jesus said to the Pharisees. You may not believe that and that's okay, I'm not mad at you. But if you can't believe that as he is, so am I in this world, at least believe for some of the fruit you see coming out of my life. At least believe for some of the fruit coming out of the ministry. You see, people can mock our ministry and cut our church down, but what they can't cut down is your changed lives. You've been our greatest testimony. All of you have been. Because people who have said this wouldn't work, people would live worse, have a hard time figuring out you. You. 